our website and click the Give Online button. There you'll find step-by-step -step instructions to give one time or set up a recurring gift. Finally, if you have any questions at all about giving electronically, please contact Pastor Todd at Tyson at RiverCity.info. River City Leadership College students discover and explore their calling to ministry in the church and in the marketplace. Whether it's pursuing a college education in vocational ministry or in the marketplace, they experience both in one place. Your experience at River City Leadership College will give you an extraordinary exposure to reaching people in ways that are innovative, culturally relevant, and spiritually impactful. Social media is such a vital way to stay connected. Here at River City Church, you can stay informed, encouraged, and supported. Tune in with us weekly on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at WeRRCC. Your giving makes such a huge impact on what is happening in our world because it positions River City Church to be strong and able to respond to needs as they arise. We have four ways that you can give. One way to give is by bringing your tithe to the Lafayette Campus Lobby and dropping it in the locked collection box on the pillar near the cafe. You can also mail in your tithe to the church. Another way to give is via text. Text the word GIVE and dollar amount to 765-300-4353. The fourth way to give is online. Visit our website and click the Give Online button. There you'll find step-by-step -step instructions to give one time or set up a recurring gift. Finally, if you have any questions at all about giving electronically, please contact Pastor Todd at Tyson at RiverCity.info. Hey there, I'm Jamie Doyle, children's ministry pastor here at River City Church. If you haven't attended Growth Track, join us next Sunday for week one, where you'll learn about the story and the beliefs of River City Church. You'll also explore how you can get connected and become a member of River City Church. Growth Track happens at 11 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. We'll see you there.
stand to your feet with me. Let's begin in worship. Thanksgiving and praise to our God. God, we thank you today that we can be here, Lord, your creation, worshiping you in spirit and truth this morning. Have it the praises of your people today, we pray, God. Amen. Come on, let's sing this together. The Lord bless and keep. Lord bless you.
against us that, God, you are God with us. Lord, as we prepare for this Christmas season coming, Lord, we thank you that you are God, Emmanuel. You are God with us. You are for us, not against us. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we say amen to that. We sing, so be it to that, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we pray, Lord, as we receive that blessing that we sing. But Lord, as your creation, as people called by your name, jars of clay made to be vessels to pour out. Lord, we ask that you would help us, make us that vessel, Lord, that the power of your Holy Spirit pours out that blessing that we receive to people in our lives, people around us, in our own communities, in our families. Lord, we want to be that witness. We want to be that blessing today. Help us to do it, Lord. Give us strength to do it. Continue in worship. Sing a song that's kind of new to us. It's a simple song. It says, Make me a vessel, Lord. Pour me out. Holy Spirit, flow through.
so vessel to me. Make me your vessel, Lord. Instrument of evil.
word of God says, therefore in view of God's mercy, let us offer ourselves as living sacrifice. That's what we're essentially singing and praying through this song. I just want to invite you right now, let's just lift our hands like this to the Lord. Let's offer ourselves to the Lord. Father, we thank you today that, that you, uh, you take delight when we offer the likes of ourselves to you. Not because we have power, not because we have great abilities, but because you're able to use vessels that are yielded to you. And so today, Lord, no matter, no matter what it is that you put into our hands or put into our lives or put into our hearts, we offer them to you today. We pray, Lord, as we, as we yield to you, as we say yes to you, as we surrender to you, that your Holy Spirit would find more and more ways to multiply your goodness, your love, your power in our world, among the people that we come in contact with. We pray it in Jesus' name. If you just stay right there in a spirit of prayer. I, you know, last week someone approached me and they, they had been praying. Somebody in this church had been praying and they felt like the Lord had given them this word. Perhaps this is for you. Perhaps this is for a situation in your life. It was this, that, that this, this holiday season, God, God's going to bring home some prodigal children. Some, prodigal, some prodigals are going to come home. And a prodigal in the Bible, of course, that's a reference to Jesus' story. A, a young person who, who got lost, and they finally come home to God. It's a picture of Jesus for us, of, of how God works, how he thinks about us when we're lost. But I just want us to take a moment today. We've been focused on families during this month of November. I, I just wonder if there are those here who'd say, you know what, I've got a prodigal in my family. I've got a prodigal in my life. And you want to lift them to the Lord right now. Would you just lift up your hand right where you are? You're praying for a prodigal this, that right now in this season. Let's, let's, as you leave up your hand, let's, let's just pray over those lives. Father, we pray right now for those in our families especially who are who are lost and who are distant from you. And we're we're aware each of us that there was a time when we were lost, but you brought us home. And so God, as we think about these that we love who are distant from you, who are maybe right now somehow angry with you or angry with us, whatever it is, God, we pray by your Holy Spirit, help them to come to their senses. Bring them home in Jesus' name. God, have mercy on them as we lift them up to you. Let it be so before the end of this year that we see the prodigal come home. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, if you would, before you take a seat, I just want to encourage you, say hi to somebody from a distance. Tell them happy Thanksgiving. Give them a high five. I'll be back in just a minute. All right. Well, uh, whether you're whether you're taking this service in at a distance or you're right here in the room. Um, we're going to pray together in just a few moments over generosity, but I want to point out a few things to you that are happening right now. The first is our, our annual food drive that's happening right now through November 29th. Uh, we're receiving non-perishable goods for our food pantry. I heard an incredible statistic last week from uh, Terry Gilbert, our, our community center director, you know, our food pantry, just this year, this year isn't even over yet, but just this year, our food pantry has helped 11,000 individuals. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And so, a way that you can be a part of that is by bringing some non-perishables in. There's a receptacle here, just off of our main, off of our lobby here in our building, 
um, on the canopy side of the, of the lobby. Also, uh, there's a receptacle in the entrance of the community center. Again, non-perishable goods. They don't want you to please bring any glass containers. They could be problematic. Next thing I want you to be aware of is that Christmas for Everyone, the sign-up is going on right now. This is a way to bring Christmas to people who might not be able to provide it for their children. Um, you, can, you, can, you can sign up through a link that's actually on the Facebook page, and it should be coming up in the comments below if you're catching us online right now. But uh, there's a link also on the, on the Community Center Facebook page right under the announcement about uh, Christmas for everyone, it's at the top of that, that page, but uh, right now is the key time to, for you to be involved in that. I think we still have about a third uh, of the, the commitments that need to be picked up. And then the last thing that I want to mention to you is about our Christmas offering, and that is, I, I, you know, as I'm pointing this out to you, I, I want you to be aware that these are, the Christmas offering is something we've done for, for many years now. This is a way for you to bring a gift to other people and to God. And of course, that's, that's at the heart of the gospel story about Jesus. The wise men, when they came to Jesus, they, they brought him uh, gifts, expensive gifts. They brought him gold and frankincense and myrrh, gold. Gold's something that you give in order to express value and worth to someone, love to someone, something precious. And then frankincense is something that was used in, in, temple, in the temple and in the worship of God. Priests used it. Maybe you don't know what myrrh is, but myrrh was used until about 500 years ago to embalm bodies as a preparation for the dead. And of course, we see Jesus' identity in each of those things, things about his future in each of those gifts. But what I'm wanting you to recognize today is that this, this, this thing of giving gifts, this thing of giving things that are precious to somebody else, that's, that's at the center of the gospel story about Christmas. It's at the center of what Christians do at Christmas time. And the Christmas offering is a way for you to... To, to be involved in the same kind of thing, for you to be involved in giving uh, to help others. Now, this year we're going to be focused on a number of things, but I want to focus this morning on the, the local projects we're going to be involved in. And that is to say, usually most of our offering goes for international projects, and we are doing an international, some international projects in Africa and in the Middle East, but also, this year, we're focusing on some local agencies that we've had a partnership with, ministries that we've had a partnership with for a long time. And so, we're looking to give $10,000 apiece to the following ministries. First of all, we want to give $10,000 to Habitat for Humanity. This is going to help people to, to own their own home, move into their own home in the coming year, in 2021. Second group we're going to reach out to with a $10,000 gift, uh, provided everybody participates. Uh, the $10,000 gift we want to give next would be, would be going to uh, Trinity Life Mission. Trinity Life Mission is uh, a, a, a ministry that helps people, men who have uh, life-controlling addiction issues. And Trinity Life Mission tells me we can support one person through an entire year of their program with, with that $10,000. So that's, that's some, another way that we're going to be helping people in our own community. The third group we're going to give to is Matrix, $10,000 to Matrix Life Care. That's a, a local uh, crisis pregnancy group. They are, they are Christians. They're centered on, the, their mission is centered on their commitment to Christ and to faith. And so... We're going to be giving them $10,000 in the coming year to expand their testing, to, to help someone out, uh, or to, help, to help get, help, I guess, in essence, save lives. The, the last group we want to give to, the four groups we're giving to, again, uh, Matrix, Trinity Life Mission, Habitat for Humanity, and the fourth group will be Indiana Teen Challenge. Indiana Teen Challenge is a ministry we have a long history with. Many people in this church have been helped 
through that ministry. And we're going to be giving a $10,000 gift to, to Indiana Teen Challenge. That's a group that's a, a residential ministry that helps people who've gone off the tracks in their lives. And so I, I just want you to be aware that's what's happening uh, with our Christmas offering this year. And I'm telling you about it because it, it's just part of what's important in terms of generosity. Of course, your ongoing generosity to your church right now is particularly important, especially as we have people, uh, our, our in, in-person presence is beginning to taper a bit. And so your continued regular generosity to the church, to what God is doing here, is so important. I want you to know God is still working in people's lives. And uh, we're going to take a moment to pray. You can give through a lot of different means. You can give through mailing it in. You can give through uh, texting it in. You can, you can be active in, in, in giving in a lot of different ways. And I want to encourage you, keep it up. Uh, your, your giving remains important and critical regardless of what's going on in our world right now. So let's pray together. Father, thanks so much for this chance to give to you. Thank you, Lord, that you, uh, you, you, wanna, you, you take pleasure in receiving gifts from us when we bring you our best, just like the wise men did. God, I pray this Christmas, help us to see how we can bring gifts to you that are meaningful that are impactful. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You will just check out the screen and you'll see this week's announcements. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name's Riley. Thanks so much for joining us today. We are so glad you did. Hey, if it's your first time, well, welcome. We'd love to connect with you. You can help us by doing that by texting the word CONNECT to 765-300-300. 4345. You can go ahead and do that right now. If you're here in person, you could also just grab a connection card right there in the seat in front of you and fill it out. On your way out, just drop it off in the offering box and then visit our guest connections counter for a special gift just for you. Now, if you haven't been here in person, we want you to know that you can join us at our Lafayette campus on Sundays, either 9 or 11 a.m. You can go to rivercity.info and click on the red banner at the top of the page to find details about our precautions that we are taking both for your health and those around you. Whether you're watching from home or here with us today, would you invite your friends and neighbors to join you? Take a moment and share it on Facebook, broadcast, or rivercity.info slash live right now via text or social media. It can make a huge difference in someone's life. Next, growth track is something very important here at River City. It helps us discover our purpose in the church community. If you have not experienced it yet, we would love to see you there. Growth track happens at 11 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall each week. And guess what? You don't have to sign up. Just show up and take your next step. Week one is next week, so that's a great time to get started and jump in. Water baptisms are also happening next week. So if you're interested in taking that next step, make sure you go to rivercity.info slash baptism to get more information. All right, everyone, that's it for me. I hope you have a fabulous week. See you next time. All right, well, with me here on the stage today is, uh, is Kathy Lang. Kathy and her husband Harvey, they're, they're part of our church. They, they attend the West Lafayette campus that will be reopening in January. And they are also people with a long history in, in, in ministry. Uh, Pastor Harvey and Kathy, they led the Assembly of God that's in uh, Attica for 30 years. And also, uh, Kathy leads Families United, which is a, a counseling group that has different locations throughout the state, including right here in Lafayette. And we've been, we've been talking about families. I just wanted for Kathy to join me today just to, to talk with us a little bit about her experience. You know, Kathy, you've You've listened, I suppose, for thousands and thousands of hours to people about relationships, about families, about marriages. And so I'm just curious to know, what, what kinds of things would you tell us contribute to the most to family well-being? Health. Thank you. Um, of course, number one is faith, shared faith within your family. 
and forgiveness. Those are the two typical most important things. Next, we would look at love, looking at each other's love languages and understanding how people receive love. Kindness is incredibly important. Just being kind to one another and teaching family members to be kind outside of your own home. Then we take a look at time together. Time coupled with love equals connection. And we specialize in relationships. And then finally, we take a look at resilience. A resilient family will make it through a lot of things. And a family that believes in restoration will excel. All right. And it's interesting because all those things are, are the values that the scriptures talk to us about. All, all of them. Um, so if... Uh, if I was having some problems in my family, what, what are some, some signs that my family might benefit from a, a therapist or a professional counselor? I think if you start to see family members withdrawing from the family, that's one of your first signs. If you see a lot of depression and anxiety, if you begin to see changes in behavior or you're having issues with your children or family members, if there's death or tragedy, any type of trauma, um, any issues that bring stress upon the family, it's great to talk to a therapist because therapy means healing. And if you can find healing with guidance along with the Lord, it's, it's very, very helpful. Just, just one last question. That is, you know, if, uh, if I was in a place where I, I felt like I needed to approach a counselor or I needed to... Uh, get help from a therapist. What are some What are some questions that would be helpful for me to ask when I contact those people? Well, right now, because of COVID, a lot of counseling is actually online, and you can go and do a search on Google for online therapy or just general counseling or mental health. The things that are important to ask um, are: Do you take insurance? What are your fees? Um, do you do Christian counseling? There are wonderful um, resources and counselors in the greater Lafayette area, and um, you can simply ask, go to those agencies and ask, do you have Christian-based counseling that is biblical-focused, um, that, that the therapist has an understanding of my biblical beliefs? Um, that'll be very, very helpful. There are wonderful um, therapists in the community that you can approach. Yeah, yeah. And so I, I want you to be aware that um, in the comments section of today's, um, today's online broadcast that where you can watch it on Facebook or whatever, there are gonna be, there, there's a link in the, in the comments that will I'll link you to, for example, some helpful books and, and some other things. There are also some hard copies in our lobby as you leave today, if you'd like to pick up just some uh, some uh, suggestions that Kathy has that that are related to the things we've been talking about, but especially that that reading list you might find really helpful. Hey, would you help me to thank Kathy for being with us today? Thank you, Kathy. Well, today we're going to finish uh, our series on the blessed family. We've been talking about <coughs> the blessed family throughout the month of November. And uh, we've, been, we've been, in order to examine the blessed family, we've been looking at what J Jesus said are the kinds of things that God blesses in terms of what, what needs to be present in our lives. And when we talk about blessing or being blessed as a family, what we're talking about is, is God-given love, peace, joy in the context of our relationships. And I, I think that, that all of us want that. All of us, for example, when we're, when we're old, we want to still have the admiration and love and, and closeness of our families. 
And there are some ways that we can take steps toward that, toward those goals. And we find, we find these kind of paths in some of what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He starts out the Sermon on the Mount with what are called the Beatitudes. These are statements about who is blessed. And so, so this month we've looked at, you know, the person who's blessed is the person, for example, who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. And we talked about how the family that is focused on experiencing God and living for God will be blessed. We talked about how Jesus said that those that are merciful, those that are pure in heart, are blessed. We talked about how to cultivate that in the context of a family. We also looked at blessed are, uh, last week we looked at blessed are the peacemakers. We talked about the significance of making peace in the context of our own family. Sometimes that's, that's the hardest part. And today I want to I talk about things from a different point of view, a different angle. And that is the last thing that Jesus says as he's talking about who is blessed, it might surprise you, is that Jesus says the person who is blessed is the one who's persecuted. And so we're, we're going to explore that a little bit. We're looking at, we're in, and this is, this is tied to this key series idea of, that we've been looking at all month long, and that is that the family that aligns itself with God's promises will be blessed. The, the, the things that God has promised, if your family will be like focused and centered on those things, it'll bring blessing to your family. Now, as Jesus says that people are blessed who are persecuted, this is what he says, because it's, it's kind of a mouthful. It's here in Matthew 5, verses 10 to 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So, in other words, the, the person who's persecuted because they're trying to live the right way they're blessed, according to Jesus. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile, that's a word for insult, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So Jesus is giving us some examples here of what persecution looks like. It's not just putting, being put in jail, but it's, it's being... Uh, it, it's, it's being the brunt of people's jokes. It's being the object of gossip. It's people kind of pushing you aside because you follow Jesus. It says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So I, one thing I, I just want you to be very clear about <clears throat> is that both for individuals and for fami families, persecution, if we can go to the next slide, persecution is the privilege of the Christ-centered family. So uh, when you have that as your understanding, that if your family is going to be focused on living for God, doing the right thing, living according to your, the, the values that come out of the Bible, persecution is part of that, and Jesus defines it as a privilege. Now, what's it mean to be persecuted? Well, it means to endure hardship because you're living for Christ. Now, as I'm talking about this, I have been in parts of the world where they are experiencing persecution for the Christian faith on a level that I can't understand. I've baptized people in this church, for example, who, who came from Iran. And, and they had to make the decision as they were making their decision about Jesus in, in this church and to be baptized that they, they really would never be able to go home because persecution is that intense where they're from. There are places in this world where people have their tongues cut out if they confess Jesus is Lord. There are, there are places in this world where, where people lose limbs for converting to Christianity. And so when I'm talking about persecution, I'm not losing sight of the fact there are people who are persecuted much more intensely in other parts of the world for the time being. But I, I want you to recognize persecution, it happens right here in the context of our own country 
and our own culture in America. You know, persecution, because of the way you live, being persecuted for righteousness, it's something that's there at the very start of the Bible. And in fact, this is a really common theme throughout the Bible. I don't have time to review it all this morning. But I want you to know, for example, every single book in the New Testament talks about persecution and suffering. Every single book. And the Bible starts with a story almost at the very beginning about persecution. Cain and Abel were the sons of Adam and Eve. And Cain hated Abel so intensely because Abel did the right thing and he had the kind of right heart, his character was right. It caused Cain to hate Abel so much that he killed him. That's that's one of the first stories in the Bible. And I just want you to be aware as, you, as, as we explore this that persecution for living a righteous life, it's coming because whenever you're living differently and you're making different choices and you're insisting on different truth values than what the people are around you, it's going to create friction. So maybe people will make fun of you, for example, because... You, you don't explore everything that there is to do with your sexuality. Or maybe like they discover, you know, that, that uh, you've got certain standards for your children uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, the kinds of entertainment you're going to take in. Or maybe, uh, you know, they, they learn that, maybe people around you learn that, you know, you're, you're not going to send your kids to an athletic league because... Uh, it, it only happens on a Sunday, and that would mean you'd have to miss out on church. And so people around you might say, boy, what, what are you doing? You're, you're so you know, damaging Jimmy's chances here of, of being a professional soccer player. No, he's only four years old. You know, it's okay if you miss it. But uh, uh, if, you, if you're going to be a Christ-centered person and have a Christ-centered family there is going to be some level of persecution, some level of misunderstanding by the people around you. And in fact, the Bible suggests that it's not just a few people or believers who will be persecuted, but it's everyone who tries to live a godly life. In fact, look at it here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who try to live the godly life, will be persecuted. Every one of them. And so, uh, uh, as each year passes, right here in America, our culture grows more and more hostile to Christians and to many of our most basic values and beliefs. I'll give you just one example right now. But it was just in June of 2015 that the law in America changed to allow for uh, same-sex marriage. Now, before the law changed, if you can remember back that far, before the law changed, most religious people, not even Christian people, but most religious people in America would have said that there was something not right about that kind of marriage. That, in fact, it, it couldn't be blessed by God. And it was kind of understood, well, that's a, that's a deeply held faith conviction. Well, then when the law changed, some, some subtle changes happened in the way that our culture looks at people with religious convictions about anything to do with sexuality or gender identity or whatever it is, so that, <clears throat> so that now, if you hold the belief, for example, that that same-sex marriage is, is not what God wants for people, or that it's wrong on some moral level, then, then you're not just mistaken. In our culture, you're thought of as a bigot. You're thought of as someone who, 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 who is morally reprehensible because of your belief. And believe me, it's just the start of it. I'm telling you, persecution just on a social level, is real, right in our own time. 
our, our own culture has, has not only come to think of some of our, our moral um, objections to the world around us as bigoted or wrong, but as time passes, our culture becomes increasingly hostile toward Christian faith, toward believing what's in the Bible, toward proclaiming what's in the Bible. And, and with that in view, how, how in the world can you prepare yourself and your family for persecution? What can you do? What can be done? I, I, that's, what, that's the question I'm wanting to answer this morning. How, how can you prepare your family and yourself for persecution? The first is this. Expect it. Expect it. You know, I received a text this, this week from a young woman in our church, and, and uh, she had heard this message when I recorded it for television this week, because it goes on, uh, on the, the local Fox affiliate. We recorded it earlier in the week. She heard the message, and she said, she said, oh, she said, I want to thank you for your message. She said, uh, Thanksgiving is always really hard because often... My family will sit around at times and look at me like I'm the weird one. She says, or, or they will not invite me to play the games they do because they're adult games. Because I'm strange. I don't fit. And I know that's the case for many of you. You, you are in family settings where your persecution is coming right from your family. But I want you to hear today that you should expect that persecution will come. In fact, Jesus told us to expect it. Look, John 16, 33. Jesus said, <coughs> he says, in, the, in, in me you, have, you may have peace. He says, in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You're going to have trouble. Things aren't always going to go right. You're going to experience persecution. And just, just a few verses before this, look at what Jesus says. He says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of this world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. What's Jesus saying? Jesus is telling us here that because we're grow, as we grow in Christ's likeness, just like they went after him and hated him and plotted, in fact, to kill him, that, that we can expect the same kind of resistance and friction for ourselves just living in this world. I was talking to a, a woman after our first service. She's been a part of this church for a long, long time, many decades. She said, I want you to know, I, I'm an 81-year-old I'm an great-grandmother, and I was speaking to my great-granddaughter just this week about abortion. And I was explaining why it can't possibly be a good thing or a right thing or something to remain neutral about. She said, and I, I had to stand strong with her. She's got her own thoughts. And she was like, it just, it creates this, this distance and this dissonance, basically, in her family. It shouldn't be something that surprises us. It should be, we should recognize, Jesus is telling us here, it's inevitable. So expect persecution. A second way you can prepare your family and yourself for persecution is to endure it. Endure it. That is, stand up under it. Hold on to your faith and to your positions right where you are. Don't, don't give in to this this other way of, uh, of looking at things. Don't give in to the criticism that's offered to you because you follow Jesus and you're trying to do what 
the Bible says. It, it just may be you might not get invited to the party. They might make fun of you to your face. They might make fun of you behind you. You might not get it in, included in the business deal if you're a business person because they know you have a penchant, for example, of, of being absolutely honest. It might be that you, you don't, uh, you're not included in a discussion because they know, your, your, your group of friends or the people you go to school with know that, they know where you stand already. They don't want to hear from you. They think that you have a repressive point of view. You, you might be ridiculed for holding to the beliefs that, that make you different. But endure it. Stand up under it. Look how the Bible, the Bible even tells us to endure it. When, we, when, when persecuted, we endure. It's found in 1 Corinthians 4. It's, it's, it's a basic step that we need to take with persecution. We need to expect that it's coming. And then we need to not allow it to turn our beliefs or to turn our values from what we know is right. And this in particular is really important for the family. And that is this, uh, and it's related to this thing about enduring. And that is that the, the more that a family uh, is aware of, of, its, uh, of its, uh, its, its identity, the more a family can articulate what its values are, or why it makes the choices that it does, or the more that a family can explain to you, for example, how the Bible informs the choices they make or the opinions that they have, the less that the persecution from the outside is going to have an impact. I, I would say it like this, and I, I'm talking about Christ-centered family identity. That is, Christ is in the center of your life together. You're all trying to live for Him and follow Him and make decisions according to what He says, what He wants. Here's the, here's the impact. When, fi when family identity is strong, when the family knows what they believe, they know who they are, they know who Jesus is. When it's not just like going to church, that's all you are as Christians. When it's more than that, peer pressure weakens. If, you, if, you as a, if, you, if you're a parent and you have children who are giving in a lot to their peers and the, the, the pressure that they have that they bring on your kids to to abandon their beliefs, for example, it just might be a sign that, that your children, that they, don't, that they have not been given a clear understanding that the family identity is that you belong to Christ, that you're going to live for Him no matter what. And the opposite happens here. And that is that when family identity is weak, when when uh, being connected to the church, for example, is, is an option to you. It's not really that important when, when you know, you don't, you don't really bother to make decisions about real life things based on what the Bible says or what prayer says or whatever it is. When, when your, your identity as a Christian is, is only a cultural thing and your family becomes, uh, even though they wouldn't say that, they're aware that your, your faith is only marginally important in the choices that you make and in the values that you, that you make and in the way that you choose, your, choose to spend your time, your money, your, 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 uh, what you spend your lives on. When, when your family has a very weak idea about who it is and what it means to be a Christian, then peer pressure, it becomes stronger. You're, and, and in particular, those of you raising children, don't worry about being a repressive parent. That, that's something that our culture talks about. They, 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 they make it seem like it's horrible that a parent would impose their values or their view of the truth or, or, or their faith or whatever it is on their children because their children just need to make up their mind. And what I'm saying to you is, if you don't get really strong with your kid, about who you are, about the choices you make, about why you've made those choices, and about the fact that they, that they originate from the Bible and from your experience with God. If you, don't, if you don't do those things and shape them accordingly, 
Listen to me. The world will shape your children. People who are without God will shape your children. And so that by the time your children are 20 and 30 years old, they will likely be secular people. Because they were never given a strong impression of what it meant to follow Jesus in the first place. Following Jesus means that we can expect persecution. Following Jesus means there are going to be people who disagree with us and will maybe even try and, and put us down somehow. And we've got to endure it. The third thing that you can do to prepare your family for persecution is to embrace it. Embrace it. Look how, look how Peter says it. Peter's, Peter's writing to people here uh, in the New Testament. He's writing to people who, who are experiencing intense persecution. They're, they're, some of them are being uh, thrown into the fire uh, when they are found to be uh, Christians and they won't renounce Christianity. Some of them are losing their, their, their livelihood because they're, because they're followers of Christ. Others that he's writing to here, they're, they're, they're experiencing in this part of the world that he's writing to a wave of persecution. And this is, this is what Peter writes to them. He says, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. What, what's Peter telling us here? Peter is telling us that we should not be surprised by persecution. We should, we should in fact expect it, but, but we should look at it as a sign of, that we are following Jesus. Right? That's, that's similar to what Jesus said. We looked at it in John just a few moments ago. Jesus said that the reason why we're persecuted is because they persecuted Him. And what I'm saying to you is that you need to think about your life. And if there is not friction between you and your unbelieving colleagues or friends or fellow students, or whatever it is, if there's no friction between you and them, then you just might be walking the same way that they are. You just might be walking in the same direction. If, if everyone in your life who doesn't believe in Jesus is somehow, somehow at, uh, they, they are somehow at peace with you about everything and all the time, then it's likely... Your, your, your commitment to Christ is not really making it into your everyday life. Persecution should be to us a sign that we're headed in the right direction because we're walking in, the, in, a, in a direction that's opposite to where our world is headed. Now, I, I recognize that persecution's not fun. You shouldn't go out of your way to upset people or to rattle people's cages for no reason. But what I'm saying is, you don't have to do that. When you're living as a Christian, people will find reasons quickly, many reasons, to disagree with you. And to even hold it against you. I can remember, I can remember when my family and I, we moved to Paris, France. We were planting an international church there. It's where I, I left to come here. I left from, from France to come here. And um, not long after we got there, there was a, a discussion online uh, in, in a forum that was all mothers of... of who were expats, they were, they were from other countries living in Paris. And somehow there got to a discussion about, uh, about religion and churches. And somehow my wife was identified as uh, one of the people who is starting one of these churches that wants to change people. And 
it went on for weeks. About 1,500 comments from all these women across the Paris area who were attacking my wife just because of our point of view and where we were coming from and why we were even in France in the first place. Because they wanted to be left alone, in essence, with, by the Christian faith. They, they, they didn't want for the Christian faith to follow them to where they were. It was a painful thing to go through, the, that kind of ridicule. And, and in fact, even to come across people later on who, who read that stream or who had commented on that stream and to realize it, it poisoned our chances in, in building a relationship with them. And I'm saying to you today, if you're experiencing persecution in your life, if you're experiencing dissonance in your life, maybe, maybe even it's coming from within your own extended family. Don't be sad about it today. Jesus told us to rejoice because of it. Jesus told us, and, and Peter tells us here, to recognize that it has to do with the fact that we belong to him. And we are, the, the more that we become like him, the more that we're going to distance ourselves necessarily from people in our world who don't live from him, for him. If you would, I just want to ask you if you would, just, just pray with me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today for Jesus Christ, that he comes showing us the way to the blessed life and some of this, God, it's hard for us to handle. Some of us, we're, we're naturally quiet people. We don't want anybody's attention. We don't want anybody upset with us. And the thought that, the thought that persecution is coming if we're going to live for you, that's, that's something that's hard for us to bear, or hard for us to imagine. But today, God, we, we want to pray, first of all, that our commitment to you and our, our, our desire and our, our execution of living for you in this world will be so clear that we, we might even experience for ourselves uh, rejection. God, uh, we pray for our families today, especially for children who are walking through some of these things and discovering for themselves, as my own children did, when they were attending school, uh, th th that, that not everyone agrees with us. That in fact, it may make them angry, it may make them think, they may hear from their classmates that, we're, that we hate people or that we, 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 don't, um, we don't really, uh, uh, we don't, w that we're stupid or whatever it is. God, I, I pray for every person child, that you'll strengthen them, to, to keep their resolve, to endure it. And I pray for every parent, and grandparent, other person of influence in the lives of these children that are experiencing these things, that, that we will unflinchingly and courageously point to the joy that there is in being identified with you. And we just ask these things today in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for our families that they would be blessed in every way as we align them with you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen, I want to ask you right now, if you would, go ahead and stand with me. And as you're coming to your feet, prayer teams are coming right here to the front. They want to pray about whatever kinds of needs you might have. And so today, if you'd like uh, to receive prayer about anything at all, as you come forward, Make sure you just <coughs> slip that mask back on. Show them that respect. And uh, the rest of us, we're just going to lift our hearts to God right now. Let's lift our hearts. Let's lift our song to the Lord. He's our hope. strength 
fight the battle and confidence when all seems lost. Promises they are true. You always do what you say. go from here this morning, uh, I want to remind you that in two weeks, we're going to be having an open house at our West Side campus on Morehouse Road, it's near Morehouse and Sagamore Parkway. I want to invite you to come there after church and just see what that's like that's going on from following the, the first service at 1030 until 130 in the afternoon on Sunday, December 6th. Also, uh, as you go from here, I just want to wish you a happy Thanksgiving. I hope that is full of God's blessing and goodness. And I just want to bless the Lord to the King of all ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Give Him thanks. Amen.